So someone asked a question about reputation that I was about to answer, then I realized I don't work for eBay anymore, so I cannot answer it. <laughs> um, so when I was asked to present here, I had about four titles and four different abstracts, depending on where I was going to work. Um, so finally this came about. So I, I've been with Microsoft only for um, two or three weeks now, and have been at work for about eight days. Um, and this is basically talking about stuff that I'm going to work on and going to learn about. But at the same time, I'm hoping that this topic becomes uh, important for not only machine learning people, but also for uh, economists. I've had the pleasure of working with Susan and Steve and John and many other people who actually have been doing great things to kind of merge these things, merge these diff different looking fields, but should be looking at each other. And hopefully, I'm, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. I'll t talk about how people think about big data in, in small things and uh, where we could go in five years. So, um, I put together these slides last night, so hopefully it makes sense. <coughs> um, so I work for the Cloud and Enterprise Division at Microsoft, which uh, is basically pretty much everything outside of um, Bing. Um, so Mi Microsoft's a big cloud company now, in addition to Amazon and IBM and some of these other players. And um, uh, one of the areas we've been looking at is uh, internet devices. So um, I gave about 150 talks while I was at eBay for 10 years, and I would always start my first slide with the first thing that was ever sold at eBay, which is a broken laser pointer, I cannot use that anymore. So I thought I'll look for a first internet device that was out there ever. Anybody remember this? This was a, a coffee machine at Oxford University um, in 1991. This was the first device to be on the internet. Um, so this was a seven story building at, I, I guess it's a computer science department, where, and they had only one coffee pot. I don't understand why, but, um, and there were people walking up and down to get coffee, and they would, come down all the way or go up all the way and find that there was no coffee. So somebody put a camera in there um, and it would take a picture every few seconds and then uh, they would click on the site and put it on a website and it would tell you how much coffee was left. And if there was not coffee left, you just wait for somebody to make coffee and then you go later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, and that was the first internet device and it got a lot of press and actually nobody, there were a few fakes that showed up later, but you know, uh, just keep it in the back of the mind, this was the first internet device. Uh, I'll conclude with what happened to this coffee machine later. But anyway, <laughs> so what is the internet of things? I was, I was expecting myself to be the only person talking about internet of things, but until yesterday there was an amazing afternoon of companies working on uh, devices that are smart or that have uh, internet connection. Um, and you can do wonderful things with them. And this morning there was also a few companies. There was no research talk, but there were a lot of companies that were working on this topic. So, so for those you know who are in research and want to get definition of things, um, you know, a network of physical objects or things embedded with electronics, uh, software sensors, and and this is you know, for people who worked in computer engineering, computer sciences, uh, is not really new. Sensor networks have been worked on forever. Um, people have been working with devices that talk to each other through member to member messaging on uh, device to device messaging. So this is not new, but at the same time, we are used to in reinventing things and calling, giving them new names. So we're going to call it Internet of Things for now. And the estimate is that there will be about 50 billion connected objects by 2020. That's about $10 trillion business, which means companies like Microsoft, Amazon, and we have to work on them and get a piece of the pie. Um, and there are some uh, projects that we have ongoing with, uh, you know, companies which have biochip transponders and farm animals to trying to see, you know, how to best uh, you know, take advantage of whatever they give, uh, wearable devices and implants in health space, et cetera. But, but, the, but the way I look at it is basically all of this is um, the biggest competition is going to be for data. So if you are in the IoT business, you're going to be in the data business. So if you're data aware, and, and I'll give you some early examples of what we're doing, and uh, why it is a data business. And whoever thinks about data as a business here is actually going to succeed. So uh, people have seen the hype curve. Um, so Gartner every year publishes this hype curve, which is uh, um, basically, uh, it's a, they, they claim there's f there are five stages of hype of technology. So that's initially there's an innovation trigger, then there's a peak of inflated expectations, and then you know, um, everybody talks about it. So for example, this is the curve for 2013, and big data was somewhere here, and then just about going up to the hype curve, and Internet of Things was just about climbing up, so that was two years ago. And uh, if you want to look at things that are falling off, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication services falling off, you know, um, something that makes sense in this context, like predictive analysis is already tapered off. Um, so 
you want to look for the next buzzword that will last for about three to five years, then you look for this here. And, um, and then there's a trough of disillusionment where everybody goes and invests, and you know, it doesn't work out. And then after that, some people actually figure out how to use it, so that's called the slope of en enlightenment, and eventually it plateaus productivity, which means it kind of plateaus off, and people find, find it to be productive and useful to do these things. And they have this other legend here, which basically, um, you know, a triangle indicates, uh, or, or these different shapes indicates how many years before the plateau is reached. So in 2013, they said the Internet of Things has more than 10 years to live. Big data is about five to 10 years. So in another five years, we'll be talking about something else. And this is a graph for 2015. Um, so you see that machine learning is already tapering off. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, but in the Internet of Things is right at the peak over here, right? Um, if you look at uh, citizen data science, you know, that's kind of going to start tapering off as well very soon. But anyway, so um, Chris O'Brien, who writes for the Venture Beat, this is what he had to say about Internet of Things. And he said, you know, <coughs> and he, every time the hype curve comes, he, he has something to say about each of the top five hype items. He said, I'm experienced about it. On the one hand, if another pitch for, uh, uh, is there another pitch for a dog collar or a connected four? Yes, sir, there was an amazing pitch for a connected toothbrush. Um, a company who works here, basically you have a toothbrush, it's a smart toothbrush, um, you can connect it to an app on your phone, as you brush your teeth, it will figure out uh, how well you're brushing, and it produces personal analytics, and uh, probably even send an email to your dentist to say, you know, um, or, or you can basically validate whether the dentist is charging too much or not. Um, so there are all these, at the consumer side, there are a lot of interesting products showing up, and it, by the way, I bought one, it sells on Amazon, uh, it's on sale on Amazon for $99, um, <coughs> but uh, the CEO here, uh, is, um, Thomas, who I was talking to, he said, and we make a lot of money on the replacement brushes. That's what he said. <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, they are kid friendly versions. Okay, got it. But, but he said that, you know, uh, we don't know. It's a disruptive technology, indicates it. Once it is widely deployed, I, I kind of believe it. So that's kind of what he said. So um, if you look at uh, countries where these, these kinds of internet of things are um, really popular, South Korea. So this is about for every 100 people, how many devices are online. So South Korea um, is about 40, uh, and France is somewhere at 17. So these are kind of the top 10 countries. Uh, IoT is very well understood or, or studied or you know, uh, products are being built around. Um, so we look at three major areas, and you might have seen this before. So one is connected homes and buildings. So basically, you know, you got smart bulb. You can buy the Philips uh, um, uh, smart bulb, which comes with a hub and about 12 bulbs. You can put in your house. The bulbs talk to each other as you walk out of the room, or it, you can, it, it, it's smart enough to turn itself on or off, or you can tell it to turn it on or off, and so on and so forth. Then there is the connect, connected fleet business, which is basically connected cars, as we're working with um, uh, Shell Oil Company, which deploys all these uh, trucks, and uh, they want to know how these trucks are performing, where they stop, how uh, you know when they fail, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, how they deliver oil, and they want to figure out if they can do something with it. And there's some work we're doing where we can show that you know by doing predictive maintenance, we can save them as much as 10 million dollars a year. So that's kind of very easy money for us. And third is connected life, which is you know your Fitbit and your you know health insurance and your doctor's appointment, etc., etc., so on and so forth. So these are three areas where a lot of stuff is happening in safety. So I'm going to briefly talk about connected cars. Um, so if you go back to you know, how this technology evolved back in 1960, you know, basically it's only the Department of Defense who had access to any kind of tracking, and they were using it for tracking civilian vehicles. 1993, we had the GPS for civilians. And 2000, we got telematics, and you know, today we can't live without it. And there's a lot of prototyping prototype self-driving cars, but also there are self-adjusting cars and par self-parking cars, which have become real, right? And the, uh, the studies say, or, or estimate is that by 2017, about 60% of the new cars will be connected car solutions. So which means they either connect to a hub uh, or a central server where they uh, give information about themselves, or they will talk to each other and uh, you know, uh, exchange messages. And there will be, by 2020, 50 million connected cars. So there's going to be a lot of data, uh, private or public, uh, and there's going to be a good amount of science to be done there. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. Probably most of you already know. So, <coughs> what is the cloud story here? So, uh, where Microsoft comes in, or where companies like Microsoft come in, is because we, we want to propose a cloud solution. Now, again, this connected car uh, concept existed before, except that they were in a private setup, very expensive, and not much good work on it with data. So, 
Now, when companies like Microsoft go and pitch a sort of cloud solution to them, they kind of say, okay, you're going to take, very much like how website uh, data centers were built before. You, you had expensive data centers to manage your servers, manage your applications. Now, suddenly, everybody's going on the cloud. So it's very much like that. You go from private expensive IT solutions to a cloud solution. <clears throat> so uh, basically, this is how it happens, communication. These devices communicate with each other. Uh, and with the central station. And central station is the one that runs the an analytics for you and also uh, any corrective work that needs to be done. And very well-known protocols are MQTT and HTTP. It doesn't really matter what they are, uh, and they existed for a while. And also, uh, people often ask about security, and the communication is fairly secure, and uh, uh, there are many, many uh, uh, areas of work that's being uh, done in terms of improving security, et cetera. <coughs> And these devices are typically programmed to sense of telemetry information that can be processed in the cloud. And one of the communication patterns, I mean, as, as people who develop languages, I'll talk about uh, you know, what, what kind of language extensions we are doing, um, reactive communication is very, uh, very common. So what, what's reactive communication? Basically, most of these devices have a, a limited intelligence, and all they say, if something happens, then do something. So what we call as FTTT pattern, which are RFP pattern, which if this, then that pattern. So that's kind of how they communicate. So a couple of examples of an if uh, recipe might be if the humidity goes, if the humidity goes about 80 per, above 80 percent, trigger a notification alert. So that's the kind of communication you get. So that gives you a pattern for how data is stored, how the data is queried, what kind of analytics you can do on top of that. Or if the battery charge is low, email a service station. Or battery charge is low, raise an alert of some kind. Or you might have a very simple do recipe, which basically said at 7 a.m. in the morning, broadcast the humidity information. So you get. Every, every morning, 7 a.m., you get some humidity measures out of these devices, right? Or if you have a home, home network of uh, Philip Hue uh, bulbs, you might just say, turn on the bulbs at 7 p.m. every day. And it's very much like your alarm sprinkler. Now, so for this, all you need is a Wi-Fi connected software or a device, and you can build up these recipes, then you get a certain pattern of uh, messages, and then data, and then you can run analytics on that. So, uh, and Steve had this thing about, you know, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analysis, and we think about it exactly the same way. He kind of put uh, economists in the third bucket. Um, talking to business folks, uh, a lot of the money is actually here uh, because it's a new area. If you go and give a summary information of everything that's happening with their devices, they give us a lot of money. Um, that's kind of what is happening today. So analytics in the IoT space is at its primitive, very, very early stages. All I have is, I give you a bunch of SDKs, you go, go and put these um, uh, uh, devices uh, in, on top of your, let's say, smart fridge, you put a device on top of it that sends messages, and I collect those messages, and I run, run analytics on them, I give you a monthly report or a weekly report or a daily report, and you pay me a lot of money. That's kind of a very successful business model. Today. There is some work on predictive ana analytics that's being done, so basically taking historic information and uh, predict occurrences of events. So this is one, one uh, so for example, if you want to figure out uh, power failure. So one of the works with um, uh, Shell is to say, when, when should you uh, do your service maintenance of your, uh, of your trucks? So typically you would say every six months do your maintenance, but here you would just say, hey, based upon some patterns, you don't have to do every six months, you have to do it when X, Y, and Z happens. And that will uh, help you save some money. So you don't have to do uh, servicing too early or too late, uh, you can actually, based upon some other things happening on these devices. Or if you've used an Amazon Eco product, you can pre-order products based upon all the information that's there. And finally, prescriptive is the area where, which is basically, uh, there's, in the future there's going to be a lot of money, but it's going to require a whole bunch of, you know, uh, technologies and techniques that, uh, that can make good use of this data. So what should I do about that? So you can take, collective, for, for example, you can take collective intelligence of these devices and prescribe certain behaviors to individual devices. So you've got a lot of these devices that are connected, and you can kind of, from, um, encourage one device to behave a certain way because other be devices that behaved a certain way had certain performance. Um, okay. So um, where, where does science happen? There are two areas um, that science can happen. So if you look at companies like Google, they have specialized hardware where uh, you know, they're, they are GPU devices and they can actually do deep learning right on their devices, but these are highly specialized devices. Uh, and these are not commodity devices, or IBM Synapse chip, or Nirvana, et cetera, so where all of the science happens within the devices. And mostly what I'm talking about is 
kind of making decisions on the edge, which means it's cloud telemetry and cloud-based analytics. So all of the data goes to a cloud service and all of the analytics and, and, and algorithms happen in the cloud service. Yeah. So, um, and there are a lot of, the, lot of the talks that were given yesterday and today were in the consumer space, which means how consumers can have intelligent devices, take advantage of it, et cetera. But for companies like Microsoft, a lot of the opportunities are in this B2B or B2B2C space. And so you, you bring in an uh, internet uh, service provider and you basically provide these solutions to big companies like, you know, uh, and elevated companies like this and, um, or you provide a service to um, uh, Shell. So if you, uh, another way to slice that thing is to say, okay, there are three opportunities here. So very quickly, you know, you can simply just by connecting and monitoring and provide them operational uh, uh, excellence. So you get into the business here. And after that, you can provide them with business intelligence where you can kind of do predictive maintenance example I gave you. And then the last part is really business transformation where you can just say, how do you, how do you run a new kind of business? How do you grow your business differently? And one way of growing your business is selling data. So one of the companies we are working with is, um, is a smart parking meter company um, um, where they put in these um, parking meters which have intelligence in them and we collect all the data and we can give them additional data or they can sell additional data about parking patterns, search pricing, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly they have new lines of business that you can grow out of the data that we have collected. Um, so that's, that's where the big opportunity is for even our own customers. Are. So this is, this is an architecture diagram from Microsoft but you can kind of pretty much any any cloud provider who's in this space probably will have a similar diagram. So you've got these devices, um, you know, uh, IP capable devices, or planned devices, which basically uh, talk through some kind of a gateway into a, uh, and there's a protocol into our IoT hub. IoT hub is one of our offerings. And then in the back end, you've got analytics, et cetera, happening. So basically what happens is events are produced, events are collected, cleaned up, ingested into the cloud, and then they're stored or batched, and then analytics and action happen. So, so that's kind of the uh, pipeline of things. Um, so what is what is the offering from Microsoft? Um, I mean, this is, again, these are all shell holders, and these basically will evolve as time goes on. So first of all, there's an uh, IoT SDK, which means if you have a device that you want to make smart, you can slap on kind of a, a sensor device on top of that. If I want to make my refrigerator smart, I can buy one of those things that I can buy for $20 on Amazon, stick it onto my refrigerator, and have an SDK, I can have a, a program it, which will send messages to the cloud server, and I can basically send all this, uh, collect all the information on the cloud. So Azure, Azure is a Microsoft offering for a cloud. And along with it comes in a few things like stream analytics. I'm gonna talk a little bit about stream analytics, what, what it provides. If I would just want to re produce reports, then Power BI is one of the product offerings which lets you do just the reports. Um, and then machine learning platform. So one of the things with Azure ML, if you do not know, is our machine learning platform. Uh, what you get is out of the box machine learning algorithms which will, uh, uh, which will work uh, for, it's kind of the 20 rule. So if you want out of the box machine learning algorithms for your stuff, you can use these things. Uh, if you want custom stuff, then you can, um, uh, you can build it yourself. Um, so you can, it's basically a good starter space. And a lot of the customers we're working with, we are actually um, you know, providing this package of solutions and we're providing them descriptive analysis. So <coughs> when we look at data, um, coming from these devices. So, so far, you know, uh, in my experience at eBay or elsewhere, mostly we were looking at data at rest, which means data was static, uh, even behavioral data, what we would do is that we would collect behavior, behavioral data, and um, uh, even though there's a flow in the behavior, user comes in, searches, clicks, um, bids, buys, et cetera, et cetera, it is all collected data, and we would run on top of that data. Whereas in data in motion, data, there's a continuous stream of data coming through to you, and you have to basically uh, process the data as it comes in. So an example of that would be counting all the red cars in your parking lot, which is basically you can just count all the red cars or you can sample the data and count the red cars. Versus in a car on the freeway, there's a free flow of cars going through and I can just say, hey, how many, how many red cars are there at any point of time? So it's a very different technique, a very different way of uh, processing this data and very different way of querying this data. So basically data in motion, time becomes an important parameter. Right, because you can only do it in a certain window of time. Um, you know, we have all the models, uh, streaming models that we built in, in a platform like eBay was basically batch processing. So we would, we would chunk up data and then make it look like a stream, but at the same time, it was not really streaming data. And that, that model does not work in, in these spaces. So uh, <coughs> to, to process stream data, so people who have used uh, uh, 
machine learning platforms, you know, there are there are many many variations for streaming available. And what what has been done in Microsoft is basically taking SQL and extending it for uh, temporal stuff. So providing temporal extensions for SQL. Now the data store itself is like a data lake, which basically is a non-SQL store, which could be in memory or in 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 uh, in on disk um, or in stream, and that is non-SQL life. But all all this gives you a SQL layer on top of that, right? And the thing that you need mainly to, to process streams is to have the notion of windows. So basically you have a stream coming in and you can either bucket, turn that into windows and provide a query to those windows. So um, what, what I'm going to simply explain what a windows concept is. So basically if you have a streaming application, you've got streams of data going coming in here. So let's look at some number of these events as you know, somebody outputs a three, somebody outputs a one, uh, one, then there's an output of a two and a seven or a five. And these windows are fixed size. And they're basically in the SQL, we use group by to kind of contain them. And so I, I could give in this windows of this size. So now I'm doing aggregated processing at the window size. So this will be three plus one. If my aggregation is sum, I would just say, oh, this output of four, this output of two, this output of 12. And that makes it easy for me to process this kind of stream data. Um, and a lot of the queries that are run um, over SQL, uh, uh, you know, as a SQL is kind of of this nature. Right? And we offer three kinds of windows. So there's tumbling windows, which are basically windows that are attached to each other. So these are five, five second windows um, where I can do the query or I can um, uh, um, aggregate over five second windows. Or I can do um, you know, overlapping windows or what, what's called hopping windows, where I could um, kind of say these are all uh, uh, you know, 10 second windows, but they overlap by five seconds. And that allows you to do different kinds of queries. I'm not going to go into the details of that. And finally, you know, the, the sliding windows, which basically the windows, windows themselves are qualified by uh, events happening at the beginning or events happening at the end. So for example, if I, if I have a smart toll booth, I might want to ask the question, uh, all, give me all the, car, all the uh, windows that have at least three cars in, in five minute windows. And there's a kind of a SQL gibberish over here. I want, don't want to go through it, but I will have to require um, a, a sliding window for that. And if you want to, um, uh, so one of the things that many of, many of these applications require are state understanding state changes. So for example, if your truck is driving and you know, it's likely to fail, so, or it, it's, it's giving out some signals that looks like it's going to fail. So you want to query over the stream to see what is happening. And that requires you to look at the stream as two different things. So you basically have to have multiple streams over the same stream. And you might want to say, okay, it was on state A when I looked at five minutes ago and it has gone to state B in five minutes later. And does that mean that it has, something has happened there? And what you can do there um, is to actually plug into your machine learning library. So we have a classification model at the back, which might have some notion of um, you know, uh, anomaly. And did I detect an anomaly in the last five minutes? And if there was an anomaly in the last five minutes, I might just say, okay, uh, you need to do something about it. Uh, you know, more practical example, like in, or simpler, understandable example, like is, let, let's say you have two Twitter streams, and let's say people are talking about a certain product or a certain celebrity, and uh, suddenly the sentiment of the conversation changes on the stream. You want to know about it. So what you do is that you basically have two streams, where one stream says sentiment is A, which is, let's say positive sentiment, and another is sentiment B, which is, let's say, negative sentiment, and you ask the question whether the sentiment has changed from positive to negative. And the sentiment itself is basically kind of a UDF function or a, or a function into a machine learning library where it's, which does sentiment mining and says, hey, does this word or does this phrase or this combination of phrases indicate positive or negative mining? So you get from SQL a nice plugin into a machine learning library. Most of the models are classification models. You have a training data, you train it, and you kind of run through it, and then you, you, you get a signal from, uh, from the software. Um, <coughs> So um, one of the challenges with, uh, so that's kind of what what's exists today. So one of the challenges in stream-based machine learning is you, your model deteriorates very fast, right? Your model keeps deteriorating. You don't know, and depending on the application, the model might deteriorate differently. So uh, we've been working on borrowing from existing te techniques in machine learning, uh, which is basically online machine learning algorithms. So where you might either do periodic training of your model with batch algorithms, or you might do build incremental learners which basically you know, add additional data to your existing training data and, and do something. And each of them work differently. For example, you know, depending on the data horizon, you, uh, either the periodic training might work or the incremental machine learning model might work. 
right? And this is different from you know, standard time series prediction because there's a lot of non-stationarity here. So you actually need to, your model deteriorates and you need to retrain the model. Um, but of course, there's a lot of work in other fields which you know, someday we'll look at. Maybe Susan will come up and tell we should look at all of this stuff. So I'm just putting it out there. Um, you know, there's work in real-time econometrics. They have a very nice framework for how to do, you know, it's being used in financial industry. Uh, the, the bioinformatics people have used sequential and recursive pattern mining, and there's some techniques there that can be used. Uh, people in, com uh, in a cryptography have used some techniques that can be used here as well to make efficient processing in this area. So this is, I don't see this, any of these happening right now. We have barely scratched the surface of what machine learning can be done for IoT devices. If you talk to pretty much anybody, they're out of the box, you know, just doing classification models. But as we get new applications, as we get new kinds of data, as we get new usage context, I think we'll get smarter. And um, for, for us, it's kind of, uh, everything will change. For example, efficient seam processing is really important for us to build models efficiently. And, you know, uh, so we need stronger languages, more powerful languages, and more efficient ways of processing the data, and, um, and then machine learning on top of that. So this is going to, could be interesting to work on, um, for the next few years until it kind of goes down the curve. Um, so that I'm going to close, and if you're curious what happened to the coffee machine, um, so they turned out the pot in 2001 uh, because they were renovating the building, and of course what happens after that, they sold it on eBay um, uh, for 3,350 pounds, um, and a German news site bought it. So, so I took this picture last night, and. Um, it is empty, which means nobody's working there. Of course, they're all journalists. Yeah. And you can go and go to this website and click on it and you'll find the machine there. <coughs> the machine's still alive, except that uh, you know, it's with a different country. Yeah. Thank you.